Yeah. Alhamdulillah, we have started reviewing Surah Al Amdiya, which is the 21st Surah of the Quran, and you will find it in Juz number 17. And uh, last week, we looked at a bit of an introduction, a bit of a background, as well as the first three ayat of the surah. So inshallah, today, we will start from ayah number four. Inna alhamdulillah, ya rabbi laka alhamdu hatta tarda, wa laka alhamdu idha ma radit, wa laka alhamdu ba'da rida, wa laka alhamdu ala kulli hal, اللهم لك الحمد حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا الحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات عمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له وَمَنْ يُبْلِلْ فَلَا هَادِيَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَحْدَهُ لَا شَرِيكَ لَهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا عَبْدُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ رَبِّ اشْرَحْ لِي صَدْرِي وَيَسِّرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَاحْلُلْ عُقْدَةً مِنْ لِسَانِي يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي آمِينَ يَا رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ يَا غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمِ يَا أَرْحَمَ الرَّاحِمِينَ يَا ذَا الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ فَأَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ The first few ayat of this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually begins this surah in a very stern manner. What we saw last week, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is talking about how humanity and human beings are completely heedless, although the time of reckoning is just around the corner, right? And we looked at the reasons of this heedlessness, and in a sort of the synopsis of that was disconnection from the Quran, not knowing the purpose of our own creation, being in the wrong company. Literally, yeah, not looking for righteous companions who might be able to wake us up, right? And continuing to be disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not fearing accountability, yeah, and being more concerned and worried about this dunya rather than our akhirah. This was like just a little bit of a synopsis of that. Now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My Lord knows all that is spoken in the heavens and the earth, and he is the all-hearing and the all-knowing, right? Um, why is that, that he's saying that? Because special reference to context, the Mushrikeen of Makkah used to say all kinds of thing, things about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As we see in ayah number five, they used to say that the Quran is a mixture of hodgepodge dreams, right? And he, yani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has fabricated it. And then they would say that he's a poet. So let him bring a sign to us as the earlier ones were sent with. So what is this going on over here? They used to discuss amongst themselves secretly that the claim of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about his prophethood should not be accepted. And they would have all kinds of reasons for that. He's an ordinary human being like us and not an angel, right? And they would deny whatever was in the Quran by making up, you know, they would get uh, attracted to the Quran and just to reject it, they would come up with what they thought was a very rational argument that this is nothing but some hodgepodge dreams. This is nothing but mumbo jumbo. This is nothing um, substantial. It is something that he has made up. So first of all, in ayah number four, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is saying that he, and he's asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to say that, that every word uttered in the heaven and the earth, all those private conversations that they're having, they think they're having in private, are not private from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are accusing him of telling stories, nightmares, dreams, asking, saying that he's a poet, etc. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is listening to all of those conversations, right? Uh, so that's not something which is new for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, dreams have an element of personal and satanic thoughts, right? And those kind of dreams are called Aldu Ahlam. Yani hodgepodge dreams. A little bit here, a little bit there. So 
what it means is that in the first place, the unbelievers called the Quran as magic. Then they described it as a collection of disturbed dreams. And then they said it was a forgery and fabrication against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then finally, they said that he's a poet. What does this show over here? What does this show over here? It means that they are completely confused because they have never heard such amazing speech, such amazing ideas before. And they don't know what to make of it. And they are trying to rationalize it to themselves. And they are trying to rationalize it by saying that this can't be true. You know, the truth that he's come up with cannot be true. They did not submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? They did not submit to the words. A lot of them actually got attracted, but just to repel it away from them, they started making all these kinds of uh, uh, excuses in their own confusion. And you know, it happens today as well. Sometimes perhaps you and I or anybody else, they might go to a Quran class or sit in a talk and it makes complete sense. And it kind of resonates deep down inside our soul. And we're like, whoa, what is this? And it does something to us. But then when we look at the implications of having Iman on this book, having Iman on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and having Iman on the validity of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as being our leader, we realize that, hmm, okay, so this has some consequences. This feel good or this resonation that I felt inside, it's not just something uh, words to listen to or sit in an, uh, one hour um, uh, in a lecture and you know cry a little bit, etc. No, it is a lot more than that. And then we want to push it away. We don't want to commit ourselves to what the Quran is asking us to do. We don't want to commit ourselves to what Allah is saying. And by the way, this is a Makki Surah, huh? remember that. So that means there are no commandments. Right now, what are they being told? They're being told Allah is one. They're being told that he has absolutely no partners. They're being told that it is an abomination if you say that Allah has a son. And these people are mushrik. That means that they are, they have this lifestyle where not only are they worshipping many gods, but they're making up whatever it is that they feel like, whatever their heart desires, off the cuff. And they listen to these words of let go of shirk. That is the first message. That is the first message of all prophets. Allah is one. A is for Allah. Nobody comes this close second. And that has implications. And when they think about the implications, they say, hmm, I think it's best to reject it. And it's best to call it something which we can at least understand as being logical. Although if you look at it, shirk is the most illogical thing on the planet. And has always been. And Tawheed is something which is so clear, so appealing to our nature. And so simple, actually. There's no complication in it. Pray to one God, bow down to one God, listen to one God. And that's it. Actually, that is the gist of the matter. Yeah? La ilaha illallah, that is the gist of the matter. But the consequences are great. And once they understand the consequences, they want to have any kind of way to reject it. And these were some of the things that they used to say. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, not a single town from those whom we destroyed came to believe. So will they believe? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is this hint that there was no likelihood of these people accepting the true faith, even after seeing the miracles of their choice. Yeah? This, is, this is one thing that all nations did, right? Like in ayah number five, they're asking him, na? so let him bring a sign to us as the earlier ones were sent. Yani they're asking Rasulullah for a miracle. Constantly, these are the mushrikeen of Makkah. They didn't even realize that this last testament for God is a miracle in itself. The receiver of the last testament of God, the last prophet of God, is in, itself, is in himself a miracle. They didn't realize that at that time. So they are, they are, they are asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are asking uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ask him to bring a miracle, ask your God to bring a miracle. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that anybody who even saw the miracles, they didn't believe. And what happened to them? What happened to them were that they were annihilated. They were absolutely destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then in ayah number seven, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا قَبْلَكَ إِلَّا رِجَالًا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِمْ فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ 
And we did not send before you, O oh my beloved Prophet وسلم, any messenger except men who inspired, were inspired with revelation. All prophets that were sent, all messengers that were sent were human beings. Were hum- and it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? A messenger is sent to be followed, is to give us instructions from the divine. So that is why he has to be from our species. So that he has a validity that if I can do it, so can you. If I understand it, so can you. Yeah, an angel cannot be a messenger. A cow cannot be a messenger. A, a monkey cannot be a messenger. It has to be from the human species, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sunnah has been to send men as messengers. And over here, ahla dhikr means people of the book. So this is addressing the Mushrikeen of Makkah, that if you are having a bit of a problem, if they, you are stumped a little bit, go and ask the people of knowledge, the people of Torah and people of Injil, ask them if the previous prophets were men or not. Yeah. So again, this is not a new complaint. Every nation has complained about the same thing. And why? To find some kind of loophole to not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in ayah number eight, you know, kind of categorically, that we do not make them. Who's them over here? Yani the messengers, such bodies as ate no food, nor were they immortal. They were not immortal. All of the messengers, including Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, have died. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the last prophet and he is not alive. Unfortunately, there are some people yeah, who, who, who say that no, 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 no. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is still amongst us. Like, so if you do, uh, you're sitting in a in a gathering of his uh, nad and gathering of talking about him and a gathering where you're singing songs, uh, praising him, etc. So he actually comes. And that's a very false uh, 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 idea, very false aqidah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is categori- categorically saying that none of the messengers were immortal. They've all passed away. They're, they've all passed away, right? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number nine, um, then we cause the promise to come. Yani, fulfill the promise meaning what? Allah told the prophets that those who don't believe that the last day is coming, tell them to get their act together. But when they couldn't get their act together, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala annihilated them, saved the prophets and the ones Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed and destroyed those who went beyond any kind of limits. Israf means going transgressing. Israf means that you go beyond the speed limit, so to speak. And actually, this happened during the time of the messengers. But today for you and me, how does this apply? We're all going to die. That's a fact. No, how, how long are we going to live? 100, 102, 103, whatever. How long are we going to live? And even when, if you go up to that old, old, old age, are you still actually productive? Are you still actually part of this dunya? Majority of the times you're not. So no matter how much you live, you are going to be annihilated in a way. You are going to taste death no matter what happens. That is one fact that no human being on this planet can deny. Nobody has lived forever. Nobody. Everybody has tried hard, but it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And Allah says in ayah number 10, surely, certainly, we have sent down to you a book in which is your mention. Now, this is an amazing ayah. This is a beautiful, beautiful ayah. لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا فِيهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, we have sent down to you a book which mentions you. Who's you? Me and you. Insan, human beings, people. It doesn't talk, it, it doesn't talk about believers, kuffar, disbelievers, Muslims, Christians, etc. No. It is about me and you. Fihi vikrukum. Beautiful, beautiful ayah. Okay, let's see what it means, actually. Let's try to understand this a little more deeply. So the book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent, um, 
it doesn't have anything alien that we cannot understand. There are things that are mentioned which we can relate to completely, right? So the Quran, there is mention and stories of people like us. It's a very powerful phrase. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using the first word for himself and the next word for the people of all human beings, for all humans. We have said it down. And what is it? It is like a vikr for you. It is your vikr. There are a few ways to understand it. A uh, couple of meanings that scholars have told us. So first of all, in the Quran, there is mention of our story. And our, you can put a uh, apostrophe around it. My story, your story, everybody's story. The topic, the subject matter of the Quran is us human beings. Right? So a lot of times when you say, for example, read the story of Ibrahim salam, and his problematic relationship with his dad, we can relate to it if we have that kind of situation in our family. When we read the story of Yusuf salam, and the temptations he had to fight, we can actually completely understand because we are fighting a lot of those temptations ourselves. Right? Any story you pick up, Maryam salam, any of the old prophets, right? any story that you pick up, Surah Kahaf, stories of the seven uh, sleepers, we find ourselves in that. We can relate to that completely, totally, because we are living life situations like that. Even say, for example, in Surah Hujrat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about moral values and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about, say, backbiting. We can completely relate to that because we live our lives like that. That is part of our reality. That reality has not changed through the centuries. That is something to understand. All of those emotions, those life situations that are talked about in the Quran are still very much there in your, my life and in your life, in one way or the other. So that is one unique meaning of that. The other thing is, it is our way of doing dhikr. This is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you should do. In it is the exercise of your heads. Fihi dhikrukum. In it is that vikr for you, that exercise of your intellect. Now, another way of understanding this ayah, that this is for you and me. Hmm? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hardwired us into knowing him. There is his recognition, which is inside of every human being, every human being. And true self-knowledge is absolutely essential for us to establish a relationship with our creator. Right? Our soul, the human soul, contains mysteries. When discovered, they reveal the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us and they allow us to grow closer to him. Um, there's this beautiful saying, an Arabic proverb, man arafa nafsahu, Whoever knows himself knows his Lord. Now, this saying is sometimes um, incorrectly as, uh, ascribed to Rasulullah as being a hadith, but in reality, it is like a statement of one of the very early Muslims. But it is circulated widely and commented upon by scholars big time, demonstrating the wisdom it contains and that wisdom is, has been acknowledged and appreciated, alhamdulillah, because this is very much in tune with the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Very much in tune with that. Um, Imam al-Ghazali said, whoever knows the mysteries of the spirit, any mysteries of our soul, knows himself. If he knows himself, he knows his Lord. If he knows himself and his Lord, he knows his matter is heavenly in his nature and his instinct. And that he is a stranger in this fleeting world. That his descent into it is not as a result of his nature in, its, it, in itself. This recognition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept within us, right? If we reflect upon it, right? If we uncover the mysteries of his creation, then inshallah, inshallah, the, our nature of fitrah, inclines towards his worship, inclines towards aspiration of higher levels of consciousness in our journey towards him. Yeah? That is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us. Right? So whoever knows the mystery of the soul knows himself. 
And until and unless you know yourself, you will not know Allah. And the tool to know yourself is this Quran. Allah is saying that in it is your zikr. This is your, this is your book. This is where you will find yourself. We are going through a very, very serious identity crisis in this dunya right now. All humanity at all times has gone through some kind of identity crisis, some existentialist crisis, some spiritual crisis. But the, 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 the era that we are living in, you and I, this kind of crisis humanity has not seen before. Not only have we forgotten Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we have forgotten who we truly are. What is our reality? So left, right, and center today, you will see perfectly normal human beings, right? Confused about what gender I am. Confused about, am I really a man or am I really a woman, right? Confused about, I think I'm attracted to the same sex. This is a lot of confusion. All of these issues regarding, um, and it, it's getting crazier and crazier every day. Crazier and crazier every day. I don't even know how many pronouns there are anymore. Am I like, you know, me, you, his, her, their, them, whatever. It's so confusing. It is so, we have woven a whole web of confusion around our personal identity. That is the reason it is important to discuss this today. Whoever knows the mystery of the spirit knows himself. Once you forget that, then you forget who you truly are. So what Imam Ghazali actually is saying, and a lot of scholars are saying and have said, humankind, we are not just glorified animals, and we are not just clumps of cells. In each and every one of us is a potential to become a true servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to reflect his attributes, right? To have pure hearts in this dunya as well. When we awaken to that reality within ourselves, only then do we act under the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you look at it from another perspective, the state of our hearts and spiritual flaws are an indication of our relationship with the creator. The more effort we put in striving in worship and refining our character, the closer we grow to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In contrast to that, what happens? When we give into temptations all the time, we indulge the lowest parts of our ego constantly. And we're just going with the flow. You only live once and do as you please. And it's my life. And all of those slogans, which sound so fancy and so attractive. What does that do? Our ego becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Our temptations are met constantly. Like, you know, instantly we want instant gratification. And all of that distances us from the reality of who we actually are. It distances us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our minds and our hearts become bungled in what we see today. That basic recognition of who I am gets muddled up. This is an amazing scholar. No, first let's just uh, look at this before we go on. Rasulullah said that when we are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, only then we follow his guidance and he is the one who is holding our hands, so to speak, and taking us. This is a beautiful hadith of Qudsi where Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala unreported that Rasulullah said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, my servant does not grow closer to me with anything more beloved to me than the duties that I have imposed upon him, yani the faraib, yeah, the obligatory uh, um, amal that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. My servant continues to go, grow, grow closer to me with extra good works until I love him. And when I love him, I am his hearing with which he hears, his seeing with which he sees, his hand with which he strikes, and his foot with which he walks. This is a Sahih Bukhari. So what does that mean? We become vehicles of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes and loves. And then our clarity of mind and our clarity of heart is just like, you know, in the dark, when you turn on those power lights that people play football under kind of thing, and how clearly you see the ball and everything. Very clear. That clarity only happens when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves us. And when will that happen? When we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
we seek him, we search him, we understand him. And that cannot happen until and unless we understand our own selves. And where, how will we understand each other? Uh, sorry, how will we understand our own selves? We will find ourselves in the Quran, inshallah. We will find ourselves in the Quran. So, uh, Sahal ibn Abdullah, rahmatullah is an amazing scholar of the ninth century. When he was asked about this saying, man arafa nafsahu li rabbihi arafa uh, whoever defines himself for the sake of his Lord, his Lord defines him for the sake of himself. Sorry, he was asked about the saying, whoever knows himself knows his Lord. He said this, whoever defines himself for the sake of his Lord, his Lord defines him for the sake of himself. You're talking about basic definition of who I am. Who am I? Remember Alice in Wonderland? Who are you? She asks, uh, uh, the caterpillar asks Alice, uh, asks Alice and, and, and she's stumped. She doesn't know the answer. Because of the portion that she's taken, she's become very tiny and sometimes she becomes big and most of the time she's lost. So she's completely, we are like that. We have become Alice in Wonderland and cannot find our way out. And the only way to find ourselves is when we define ourselves for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inshallah, inshallah, give us that clarity for his sake. Very, very important. And I hope this is not too complicated for you guys, right? It's, it's pretty simple, but it is important to understand, inshallah. So what is the saying? Construct your personal identity around what the creator has decreed to be good. If the creator has created me a woman, then I am a woman. There is absolutely no discrepancy between my sex and my gender. There isn't. I am born a woman and I am a woman with all its glorious implications, physically, psychologically, emotionally, whichever way you want to look at it. So we must have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to define who we are. And as a result, Inshallah, Allah will reward us in the best manner. And that is the important thing over here. Another perspective which scholars tell us is, right? The heart, uh, this is also from Imam Bazali, is this beautiful, beautiful magnum opus which is called Ihya Ulumuddin, yani, Yeah, he says, the heart is that by which a human being comes to know himself. And where does the Quran work? The Quran works on the heart. The Quran doesn't work on the mind. The Quran penetrates the heart first. Yeah. If he comes to know himself, he knows his Lord. It is that by which a human being is ignorant of himself. If he's ignorant of himself, he's ignorant of his Lord. Whoever does not know his heart to be mindful of it, to be watchful over it and to observe what shines over it and through it of heavenly treasures, he is the one about whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said uh, in Surah Al-Hashr, by the way, uh, this is uh, Surah 59, they forgot, so, uh, they forgot Allah, so he made them forget themselves. Those are the truly wicked ones. We forget our Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and makes us to forget our own selves. And aren't we seeing that all around us? Aren't we seeing, seeing that in our homes? Aren't we seeing that among, inside our own selves? So knowledge of the heart, its realities and its qualities, that is the foundation of our deen and the basis of spiritual seeking. We have to be mindful of what is happening in our heart in order to understand ourselves clearly. Otherwise, there's always going to be this mumbo jumbo thing going on. So authentic knowledge of the human soul leads to better knowledge of Allah. This is the synopsis of this whole discussion. And how are we going to get this knowledge of our soul? From where are we going to get it? Is it going to fall down from the sky? It has actually been sent down from the sky. And it is right here in front of us, alhamdulillah, that we are sitting with this Quran. So when we know this inherent fitra inside of us in our soul, this leads completely to the divine attributes of our creator. And every human being is created with this recognition in themselves. And we can potentially activate it by following the path of purification. 
which the prophets have taught us and our righteous predecessors have taught us, right? It's not that we only have a theory. We have a very practical method of achieving that state of understanding who we are. And whoever achieves a higher level of consciousness in relation to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whoever aligns themselves with the heavenly nature, like people today love to say that, that uh, my chakras are aligned. So let's put it this way. Whoever aligns their chakras with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala under the guidance of uh, uh, the divinity, under divine guidance, under the guidance of the sunnah, then that person will have the ability and moral knowledge of their own personal conscience. They will know more about themselves only at this point in time when they align themselves with God, when they align themselves with divinity. Right? So uh, this is absolutely amazing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us, find yourself and you will find me. Find yourself and you will find me. I think it was Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi who also said something very similar. And unfortunately, these days, uh, people love Sufi teaching. Alhamdulillah, Sufi teachings are amazing. Uh, Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi's teachings are amazing. Maulana uh, Ghazali's teachings are amazing. But you see believers as well as disbelievers. When they hear, say, Maulana Rumi, Prophetullah, they say, oh gosh, this really resonates with me. I don't really get the Quran. And, and, and for those who are disbelievers or not, not, not yet Muslims, there's an amazing scholar um, from, I think, is it Indonesia, who always says, don't say not Muslims, say not yet Muslims. I find that so endearing, so beautiful, so optimistic, inshallah. So uh, what was I saying? Yeah. Until and unless we, we try to take out Islam from Rumi, and we say, oh, Rumi's teachings are something that touch me. Why do they touch you? Because that is from the creator. He's take, his wisdom, his teachings are absolutely in line with the Quran, with the Sunnah. He was a scholar of Islam. You cannot take Islam out of Rumi, no matter how hard you try. So he was Maulana Jalaluddin Rumi, Rahmatullah. So he also said something very similar. You don't find yourself, you won't find God. Right, and when I found myself, I found God, or something, some to something to that uh, uh, tune. In this age of identity crisis, the only place to turn to to get clear, concise reality and guidance is the Quran. Is the Quran. So when we are confused and we get about ourselves, about our kids, about what's going on around us. And we wonder, where do I begin to even untangle this? You know, because sometimes when you have a lot of uh, string and you keep pulling at it and pulling at it and, you know, uh, log, you become loggerheads and it gets more tightly entwined, uh, tangled up rather than untangling. The only untangling is going to happen through the Quran. Whenever we are, that is the reason it's very important for people like you and me to understand ourselves what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, what are the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and also to the best of our ability, in a simple manner, convey that to others. Simple manner. And again, you do not have a better, you do not have like a whip in your hand and you know, oh, you believe. Blah, blah, blah. No, there's no fascism involved in this. In fact, the fascism is coming from the other side. Thou shalt be liberal, right? Otherwise, aha. It's, it's, it's actually coming from the other side. We are not fascists. We are not. We are trying to explain things in the manner that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has taught us on the basis of knowledge with absolutely amazing character. Character meaning mannerism, not raising our voice, not frothing at the mouth, but put the point across. Now, whether that point reaches the other person's heart or not, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's job. But this is the only solution of finding ourselves. That solution is in this book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. Um, Imam al-Ghazali also said, one who knows himself, himself knows his Lord Almighty. That is enough to remove arrogance. Now, this is important. Why? Because a lot of times um, when we say, oh, I don't understand. Oh, this is my life. Oh, I know how to live my life. Don't tell me what to do. Where is all that stemming from? That is stemming from arrogance. A heart that is so heedless 
and so far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes arrogant. That is a fact. Becomes arrogant. So he says, no matter what he truly knows about himself, he will know that he is abased in every way. He is small in every way. There is nothing appropriate for him but to be humble, meek, and unassuming. If he knows his Lord, he will know that glory and grandeur are not befitting to anyone but to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? The true humility comes from knowing ourselves and what, our, what we are in relationship to God. I remember some years ago, there was this uh, image circulating of uh, various different planets. And our tiny little earth was somewhere. And if you looked at all the other heavenly bodies, what was our reality in terms of our size? And then if we look at, say, our country or our own puny little self in relationship to just the heavenly bodies, the creation of God, we are nowhere. And then we think of ourselves as God knows what, Allahu Akbar. So that is another important thing that happens when we know ourselves, we know our reality. We know our reality and we don't have this arrogance and we don't have this attitude that I am God itself, right? This absolutely beautiful poem written by E.E. E. Cummings, I always think of the Quran as that sea where we find ourselves. So I just wanted to share it with you guys. Maggie and Millie and Molly and May went down to the beach to play one day. And Maggie discovered a shell that sang so sweet, so sweetly, she couldn't remember her troubles. And Millie befriended a stranded star whose rays five languid fingers were. And Molly was chased by a horrible thing which raised sideways while blowing bubbles. And May came home with a smooth round stone, as small as a world and as large as alone. For whatever we lose, like a you or a me, it's always ourselves we find in the sea. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to find ourselves in this amazing ocean of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine guidance, to find ourselves in this amazing, amazing sea of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sunnah. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us find the way to our own selves and help us find the way to him, inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. Then moving on from ayah number 10 to ayah number 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, how many a town that were unjust have we crushed and raised up after them another people? Hmm? Uh, this word over here, Wakam, where's my, where's my, of course, uh, uh, Kashamna, Kashama, not with a uh, scene, but with a shod. It means destroyed, shattered, mangled, broken into pieces. Yani, in other words, it's not hard for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to completely wipe out one nation and then bring up another. So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically is saying, who do you think you're playing with? Yeah. Who do you think has the cards in his hand? Yeah. And this, can, this is applicable on entire nations and it most certainly is applicable on human beings. Yeah. It's absolutely applicable on everybody. And when its inhabitants perceived our punishment, at once they fled from it. Yani, when these people realize that destruction is coming, yani, the people of Luke, uh, the, the nation of Saleh, Hud, Shoaib, etc., they immediately uh, hit their heels, so to speak. Yeah? Uh, this word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used over here, minha, uh, minha yar urun, right? uh, it means to dig heels into the side of a horse. Yeah, and in modern meaning, it means running, running. Where were they running to? What was going on when they saw that destruction? Where were they running to? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, La tarku, don't flee. Go back to the luxuries you were made to enjoy and to your dwellings. Maybe you are going to be asked. Itraf over here, utriftum, uh, itraf, it means to have a lot of wealth and a very elite lifestyle, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them not to run. They couldn't run anyways, actually. And ask them, why aren't they doing, uh, uh, going and living in their luxurious homes and mansions? This is, a, this is sarcasm from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So Allah is saying, go back to your servants, your mansions, your wealth, whatever it is that you are hoarded, and uh, ask them, 
for well-being and needs, right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over here is also saying, maybe you will be asked, yani, they will be interrogated on the day of judgment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from among those who are not so heedless and not so far away from him that we don't remember this reality. There's no running from God. Where are we going to go? Seriously, we should think about this. Where will we go? Is there any place to go? Right? Ali ta'ala used to say something so beautiful. He would say that if you find a place that Allah will not watch you, so then go there and do sin. Sin in a place where God will not watch you. God will not see you. Where is that place? Is there any place like that in this dunya? Or is there any place that we will be able to find refuge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That is the reason our only refuge is God. While we are living and at the time of our death, the only one who can save us, the only one who can protect us is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, that is actually uh, 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 what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries to tell us by giving us all these very, very stern examples of people who, run, who think that they can run away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah says in ayah number 14, they said, Alu ya wailana inna kunna zhalimeen. Woe to us, indeed, we were the wrongdoers, we were the zhalimeen. So the word zulm in the Islamic context means that you take something from its rightful place and either you elevate it to a position that it's not meant to be or you lower it from the position that it's not meant to be. So they are actually going to admit this, that yeah, we are the Zolami. They're not going to say that we were very clever. Although it's in this dunya, when we transgress, when we go beyond the limits set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we completely ignore the sunnah saying that they are archaic and this doesn't make sense and I'm so clever and science is so clever and so and so is so clever, yeah, they're going to realize when they see what is in store for them. Yeah, Allah, we were the zalimi. We ourselves absolutely did the highest possible disfavor that a person can do to their own selves. In Urdu, we say na, ke wo pair pe kulhari, uh, put se kulhari mal, marli. It's just like that. That we had been banging that axe against our own selves all our life. And we are the people who transgressed against our own selves. Then in ayah number 15, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <clears throat> Then this continued to be their cry till we turn them into stubble, totally extinguished. Special reference to context, these are the people who are actually facing the wrath of God, like the old nations, the nations of all the prophets that we had mentioned, Lut alayhi salam and Shalih alayhi salam and uh, Shuaib alayhi salam, right? When they were actually uh, going through that uh, azab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Um, continuous cry meaning that it wasn't as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the, the, uh, the punishment and they just died. It was like a whole process. Over and over again, it was happening. Uh, punishment after punishment was happening. Yeah. So that is what it means over here. If you look at this, these uh, two words, Hasid and Hamidi, Hasid is like a farm which has been plowed. You know, the tractor has already gone over it. So it's just like stubble left when the crop is uh, cut, cut. This is what they're going to look like. Right? The destruction happens, the house breaking down, earth sinking, you know, all of those things that happened and still do happen. That's, that is what it means. <clears throat> and this word, homidin, homid means the coal whose light and heat are about to die. Um, an expression is, Hamid al humma fever, it means to, for the fever to break. When the fever is high and then it falls down. It's again a figurative speech for pain and death. Until they are cut like crop and the light in, in, uh, in them is burning away. That is Hamidi. There's a reason that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses very specific words in the Quran to describe specific scenes. Now imagine, this is, these are two words, Hashid and Hamidin. But it's painting an entire picture of a whole people 
going through the punishment of God, what is happening to them physically, emotionally, right? What is going on with them? They're crying, they're screaming, they're saying, Ya Allah, we were the Zalim. They're saying that, you know, what is going on with us? We didn't realize this before. This whole picture, imagine this picture in our heads, inshallah. And why should we imagine it? So that we don't become people like them. So that we are the ones who are who are making choices which are conscious and aligned with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Inshallah, inshallah. Then ayah number 16, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاءَ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا لَعِبِينَ We did not create the heavens and the earth and what lies between them for play. Yani, this is something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats in the Quran over and over again. That this creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not fun and games. This creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meaning kya? Sama and ard and what is between them. We are between them. You and I are between them. Everything that is created, whether it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's heavenly creation, whatever is in this dunya, has a purpose. He didn't create the heavens and the earth as a game. This is not just fun and games. And unfortunately, another thing that we see around us is that everything is fun. Everything is entertainment. Everything is just for uh, the sake of entertainment. So in ayah number 17, Allah says, had we intended to have a pastime, we would have had it from our own if we were ever to do so. Yani this is not a game. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had made it a game, it would be according to his own rules according to his own command he wouldn't have let us know yeah and why is Allah talking about this like this as fun and games because you know if you look at all mushrik religions yeah it's all fun and games isn't it it's all a lot of music a lot of dancing a lot of play um whether you look at hinduism whether you look at the old uh, greeks or the the romans yeah what was that the gods, they live on Mount Olympus, yeah? And they're using human beings as like pawns in their chess game. Hmm? So-and-so is having an affair with so-and-so, so-and-so is running off with so-and-so. Yeah, it's literally like a game, isn't it? The mythology that you see around you, very playful, very playful. Uh, one uh, one uh, particular Hindu god playing and teasing women and girls, like sexual harassment, by the way, hello, excuse me. Uh, let some of the feminists know about it. Yeah. So uh, all kinds of playful stuff. If gods are like that, then what are their disciples going to be like? If this is going on in the God world, in the heavenly world, then what is going on in, on the earth? And that is the reason we find it very attractive. Human beings find it very attractive. And when they say, bow down to one God, la ilaha illallah, <coughs> Muhammad Rasulullah followed the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We are like, oh my God, but this is so boring. Should I just sit in a corner and just read the Quran all day long? Is that all I do? There is no fun. There is no uh, color. There is no music. There is no sort of, you know, smoking, whatever it is, other than my shoes. All the time, entertainment. Entertainment in worship. Entertainment wherever we look. That is what it is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is categorically saying that this dunya, you guys are not made for fun and games. There is a very distinct purpose of each and every creation. And who are you and me? Ashraful makhluqat. We are the best of creation. So how is it that we are not going to have a purpose? That our purpose is only to sc scroll hours and hours and hours on our Instagram? Yeah, there's this new thing, that there's this new app, right? Uh, after Twitter, what is it called? Threads. Or, uh, scrolling down, whatever. That has become our life. Just this morning, I was talking to a friend and uh, she was saying that it's getting to be so difficult to get people to sit through a one-hour lecture. We just don't have the attention spans anymore. Because from, uh, from one hour, we went down to, I don't know, Instagram or uh, YouTube. You still can have a longer uh, lecture or a longer talk or whatever. But people are used to TikTok now. It's another game. So are we going to make a game out of gaining knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are we going to make a game of finding out about the sunnah of, Allah subhanahu wa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Yeah. Why are we doing that? 
what is the matter with us? When the Sahaba used to sit in uh, the halaqa of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they would be sitting so still and so quietly that birds could come and perch on their heads, thinking that they were statues. We fiddle all the time, even if we are sitting with good intentions. Please, please don't have me wrong. Very good intentions that I'm going to attend a Quran class today, but I have my phone in my other hand and I'm doing something else with the. Usually, sometimes people have two or three phones also. And what do we try to pretend that the world will come to an end in an hour because I'm not available? Or if, I, if I'm not going to see what the latest update is, and we've got 20 notifications for God knows what not. Yeah. Are we making fun and games out of the knowledge of being also? That's a very serious question to ask ourselves because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that this is not a joke, guys. This is not party time constantly. This is not a feel-good thing constantly. There are many things when we start to learn our deen, when we go over the Quran, of course there are, alhamdulillah, so much stuff which is feel-good, which we, which, which really, really um, kind of you think, yeah, 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 yeah. But there are many things which are harsh. There are many things which are perhaps won't go down well with us. Many things that clash with our lifestyles. So what should we do then? Because what fun and games teach us is that entertain yourselves at all costs. This deen is not entertainment. This Quran is not entertainment. Right? This Quran is something much more serious. The teachings of Rasulullah are much more serious. We should pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Rasulullah said that the coolness of my eyes is in salah, for example. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps our entertainment and the coolness of our eyes in his worship, in the Quran, in the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we don't get trapped in this entertainment business. And it is a business, by the way. It is a, it is a business. Whether it is religious entertainment, whether it is outright entertainment, it's all Barbie and Ken. Yeah? We need to break, the, break those bonds. We, we are enslaved by this entertainment culture. We really truly are. And Allah is declaring in the Quran, that is not why I created you. That is not why I created this universe. That is not the reason for its creation. The reason is much more deeper and serious and something which is more substantial than all this fluff that is around you. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 18, instead we launch the truth against falsehood which gets it smashed and in no time it is gone. Alas to you for what you describe. Yani, we dash the truth upon falsehood and it destroys it and it departs. And for you is destruction from which you describe. There is truth and there is falsehood. There always has been and there always will be. Yeah. Majority of the times from the uh, journey of humanity, from the time of Adam salam, till the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, till our time, most people have been attracted by falsehood and fewer people stand for the truth. And this is a very powerful image in the Quran, by the way. So what one scholar said was that this image is something like that somebody is running and somebody is trying to kill that person. So the killer can't catch up to the one who's running ahead. So what they do is that they grab a spear or a knife or something and they throw it. But they throw it so hard that it bashes the other one's head. You know, the one who was ahead. Disturbing, disturbing, right? But that is the disturbing amount of hate that is around. And that is why truth hates falsehood. Yeah, that is, that is a word hates falsehood. Truth cannot tolerate falsehood in the same room. Because falsehood tries to, just like, you know, the, the magician's uh, snakes were trying to kind of uh, uh, gobble up Musa alayhi salam's uh, bigger snake. Uh, what was it? Uh, sorry, I, I completely forgot. <clears throat> uh, Musa alayhi salam's larger snake. What is it called? Can somebody help me out? So this is the way uh, 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 truth actually eats up all the falsehood that is around. So this word zahaqa is to get hit and run. Zahiq is used for two kinds of animals. One, 
that is extremely fat and the other that is extremely skinny. Why? Because those are the animals, when they see a predator, they run. But both are unable to get too far because of their physical condition and they get caught. So what Allah is saying over here to you and me, which, which may sound okay, but that's not what I see around me. But what Allah is saying is falsehood is the ultimate prey of the truth. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. The word... Um, Qadhafa means truth is far away from falsehood. They can't even be close to one another. Right? Most propaganda that we see is truth mixed with falsehood. But the Quran says the truth cannot be near falsehood absolutely at all. Truth is going to come on, come on top and falsehood is like that scared victim whose head is going to eventually get blown away. But let's look at ourselves today. This is what Allah is saying. Allah is stating a fact. Yeah. And remember, if you know a little bit of the seerah, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after the conquest of Makkah, he was breaking down idols in the Kaaba. And he was saying the truth has come and falsehood is being destroyed. And the word used by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is also in the Quran, was zahiqul haqqu bil baqir. Yani, uh, the, 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 the haqq has taken over, has destroyed, has smashed up. Uh, uh, purple. Yeah. But look at us today. Where are we today? Because we, A, we are completely confused about who we are. We are going through a serious identity crisis. Number two, we are going through this barrage of entertainment, 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 entertainment constantly. What is true? What is Bapil? We have no idea. Who's on the offensive and who's on the defensive today? Islam is definitely on the uh, offensive. Instead of the believers asking questions to the other side, what is going on? We are constantly made to doubt our belief system, our lifestyle, our choices, everything. Yeah? Our hadiths were written 100 years after Rasulullah's death. How can they be true? Right? There's not even the word hijab in the Quran, no covering in the Quran. Yeah. You hear it left, right, and say so we are always on the back foot. And we are the ones who are supposed to ask about falsehood. All the other thing is happening right now. Don't think it's going to stay like that. Don't think that it is going to stay like that. That is very important. If you look at this word, Fayyad uh, Maruhu. It is from damaga. Damaga means inner part of the head, right? Dimag. We say dimag in uh, in Urdu, right? Intellect. Allah subhanahu wa taala has always sent prophets with haq, and haq has weight. For example, Ibrahim alayhi salam was one person against an entire nation, right? And Allah subhanahu wa taala is going to demolish Babel. And this is a test for you and me and all believers to see how hard are we working to understand the truth? How hard are we working to establish the truth? So unfortunately today, if we look at the believers, where, where are we standing? We have absolutely no knowledge of our deen. Seriously, no knowledge of our deen. Pretty much zero or a little bit perhaps. We are not willing to invest any time in understanding what is in the Quran, in understanding the teachers of the teachings of uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we, we just refuse for whatever reason. Some excuse, another excuse. Although, if you look at it, the avenues of knowledge that are available today are unbelievable. You can't go out to a class or find out more about a deen. Sit in your home and find out. Right? There are various different scholars, various different teachers all over the world in all different languages, which are accessible. Absolutely 24 hours a day. It's just that we don't do that. That is one thing. Intellectually, we are completely like, you know, like poor church mouse. We are like that intellectually. The only thing that we know is to get angry, is to get agitated, to froth at the mouth. Osa. That's all we have. Now, how are we ever going to be in that race of truth against falsehood? just like all of the prophets of God were, 
all of the people worth their salt work and still are actually. So what do we need to do? What we need to do is arm ourselves with knowledge, arm ourselves intellectually, arm ourselves with the knowledge of this Quran, the knowledge of Rasulullah Wasallam's teachings. And like we talked about before, only then will we find out who we are, only then will we find out who God is, only then will we come to the truth, inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. So we're going to stop here and uh, pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Ya Rabbi, make me find myself in this beautiful ocean of your uh, book of last testament. Help us gain knowledge, be intellectually watered by this beautiful, beautiful uh, fountain of knowledge that you have given us and give us the tawfiq and the opportunity to use our intellect to use our aql, to use our dimaq for the truth rather than for falsehood. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yashikun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Allahumma rabbana ja'alna minhum ladhina amanu wa amilu shalihat wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil shabr ameen ya rabbil alameen ya ghafuru rahim ya arhama rahimeen ya dhal jalali wal ikram السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته